Hi, welcome to our midweek Bible study. Uh, it is the 9th of October, 2024, and we're going to be in the book of Psalms, chapter 40. Uh, a couple things, just continue to pray for uh, Marisha, uh, Becky's mom, that's been visiting with her, and just uh, she turned 90 this week, and so that's a praise, but uh, still under hospice care, and still could use your prayer, and continue to pray for Ron Hickman, and uh, what God has for him. And so, uh, also, we have a, a fall festival this this uh, Sunday night at 5 o'clock for the kids. It's during our regular Awana time. So, we encourage you to come out and, and uh, enjoy if you got kids that just want to come out and play some games and get some candy and just uh, kind of a community thing. But that's this Sunday at 5 o'clock. So, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask you to bless our study today. And we give you the glory for your word. Thank you for everything. We pray for Ron and for Marisha. We pray for the fall festival coming up. Let it be a blessing to the community. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to be in Psalm 40, if you would turn there. Um, and so we'll start with the first three. These are good Psalms. They're all good, of course, but they just, uh, when you take a, a little time and, and just look into them, uh, but they have one of my favorite um encouragements in these first three verses psalm 40 says i waited patiently for the lord so we're just going to look at this psalm we're going to read a lot of verses today and a lot of these verses are used in the new testament and they are um uh, they are given the uh relativity relativity to christ and so these are like messianic psalms even though dave is is, is definitely praying for his situation. Uh, they are attributed to Christ in Hebrews and John. And so it's really interesting, this kind of dual view of these Psalms. So I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. Uh, so that is a great verse just to start. Um, does God hear our prayers? When we're pleading with him, we, we met with somebody, my wife and I this week, and they were really having a, uh, a very kind of supplicative prayer request. They really needed something from God to hear them and answer their prayer. And so we, we pray along with this person that God would answer soon uh, because sometimes it feels like, boy, I don't even know if you're listening. I'm praying for this, praying for this. But that's the fervent prayer of a righteous man. You know, God compares prayer to a man knocking on a door. He gave that uh, uh, illustration you know, in the middle of the night to borrow from his neighbor. And because of his persistence, the neighbor gave. And, and God equates that to our prayer line, to just know that he's, he's hearing us and to be patient, waiting for God's timing. Uh, but sometimes we can be discouraged and feel like he's not listening to us, but he is. He's listening. Um, and we'll see more of that as we go. Uh, then verse... Uh, Verse two, it's a, it's a verse I quote a lot, not in sermons, but just in my personal testimony of what happened to me in my life when I uh, was found by Christ and, and given eternal life. And it says, he who brought me up out of a hor horrible pit, out of a miry clay and set my seat upon a rock and established my steps. This is exactly what happened to me. My spiritual, my soul, you know, I didn't have a bad life. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it was difficult. Uh, like everybody's life is. Nobody has a, a life of ease. There are uh, problems and challenges. But my soul was the one that was, angry and depressed and my sister had passed away and I was in a, in a little bit of a dark uh, place spiritually, emotionally. What, what is my life? I didn't feel like I had any um, talents or gifts to give to this world. And it was a dark time, you know, and, and feeling depressed and, and God changed everything. Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday, 1979, changed everything he literally took my soul my spirit my person 
and there wasn't any physical issues. Um, but he took that that inner man out of that horrible pit and put it on a, a solid rock. And of course, that rock is Christ. And verse three says, he put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust the Lord. The Bible says we're a, a new creature. Old things passed away. Now all things are of God. First Corinthians 5. And so he put a new song in my mouth. And that new song is the gospel. And many will see it and, and fear and, and will trust in the Lord. And what happened to Flanagan? Yeah. That testimony of what Christ did for me. Uh, maybe there's someone out there listening today that, boy, I, I want that same thing. My soul feels like it's in a miry pit. My full soul feels like it's dark. And my soul feels depressed. And my soul feels lost. And, and, and I'm telling you, Jesus changed everything. And uh, I was a sinner. And we're all a sin. There's guilt of that. But, but this wasn't a sin issue as much as it was a lost issue. I was lost, walking in darkness. Wanting to know what happened to my sister. Wanting to know, did I have a purpose in this world? And God changed. Now I look at it, you know, uh, 40, 50 years later, and it's like, man, God, what you did. What you did with that, that lost young man. Uh, it's incredible. And, and there were some growing pains, definitely. Um, but boy, did he ever take my life out of this miry pit and put it on the solid rock, which is why 1 Corinthians 3.11, Jesus is our foundation. Isaiah 28.16, it says that. He's our rock in Matthew 7.25. He's the cornerstone in Luke 20.17 and 1 Peter 2.6 and 7. Uh, he is the uh, wise man that that put, builds his house upon the rock. And foolish man would build his house upon sand. So this is about building your life on Christ, Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his ways. And, and man, I, I, God delights in me. I don't know why, but he does. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says, we're to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, doing what? making intercession for us, directing our steps, being that sovereign God who took that young man and, and out of that miry clay, put him on a solid rock and gave him clarity and purpose and, and vision for a future. First uh, Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer or a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. There's, there's a change. And that change, God says, will produce. Many will see it and fear the Lord and trust in him. Man, what, what happened to the Apostle Paul? What a new song he put in his heart. What a change. And uh, that's what it means to be salt and light. And uh, Christ does all the work. And uh, people see Christ in us when we are completely changed and different. And uh, boy, these three verses, pray to God, wait patiently until he takes you out of that miry place, puts you on that solid place. And your praise and your change and your countenance, all those things that happen to, to those who trust in Christ, the world will see and be curious about this hope that lies within you. And then your answer is simple. I confess my sins to Jesus Christ. If he confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He created in me a new person, a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. And if you will just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart he's risen from the dead, you will be saved. That's the gospel. We've all sinned. The wages of sin is death or separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. Everyone sinned. The payment of sin is death. Jesus paid that price on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day to defeat that. So if you just confess with your mouth that he's Lord, believe it, um, you'll be saved. And even that belief is a gift from God. For by grace he is saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, that brings us to verse 4. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. So either we trust this gospel we just mentioned, or we don't. And the wise man will trust it and build his life on this rock. Uh, blessed is the man who makes his Lord his trust, does not respect the proud, and, and, and nor such as turn aside to lies. And so search out for the truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So we want to trust him, but that trust is also a gift. So pray to God. I waited patiently. He inclined and heard my cry. My cry to God, I remember back in those days, was if you're real. If I knew you were real, I'd do whatever you wanted to do. I just have to know. Did my sister go to heaven? Is there a heaven? Are you real? I was face to face with death. And God heard my cry. God heard it. And, and that's what I would recommend you do. Don't talk to me. Talk to God. Go to your private area, your closet, as the Bible calls it. Cry out to him. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done. And your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be in number. You don't think God hears our prayers? David says, you think of me so often. You ever get to that point where God, do you, are you there? Do you know I'm here? Are you listening? And the truth of scripture says, he thinks of you so often, you can't even count them. Um, and who are we, the Bible says, that God is mindful of us, that he would care for us. And yet he, he knows the, the hairs of our head. And so, we want to count our blessings. You know, the Bible says in um, Psalm 103, 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Uh, we want to think on those things. Philippians 4, 8 tells us to think on the things that are noble, just, that are pure, the things that are lovely, the things that are good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. Um, do you do that? I mean, are, are we in that negative mode? And trust me, it's election season and it is uh, weather season. And there's a lot of things to be um, negative about. And we want to pray for those that are, are facing the, the trials and, and tribulations of the hurricane in North Carolina and preparing for the one of Florida. We got to pray for this election coming up. Um, God, are you listening? Yes, he is. Uh, but at the same time, be careful you don't focus so much on the negative that you don't realize the blessings, the blessings. So count your blessings. Think about them today. And then we get to some pretty amazing verses in verse 6. David says, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come, and the scroll of the book is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. So these verses is, is the idea of sacrifice and offering, which is the sacrifices is, is an offering of blood, blood sacrifice. Offering would be maybe a grain offering or a wheat offering. Um, but these offerings, he says, what you want more than that is you want uh, uh, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Um, but you want me in that I, you have opened my ears. Now you, you see that and you see my ears, you have opened and you think about, oh, I'm going to listen. You've opened my ears and I, I hear you. And God definitely did that with me. Uh, I wasn't listening to the things of God and all of a sudden, I, I understood scripture and, and uh, knew he was real. 
But in, in Exodus 21, 6, um, there is a, a ritual that was done um, uh, according to God in which a slave who, or, who, who finished his time of, of slavery was set free. But if he was pleased with the owner and he voluntarily said, no, I want to be um, your slave voluntarily, they would uh, almost put like an earring or an all AWL within the ear. And that would mark him as a, and that way the, the, the owner would not be in trouble for keeping the slave longer than he wanted, where he was required. But this was a symbol that you voluntarily offer yourself as a living sacrifice. And remember the Bible says, uh, Romans 12, one, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Um, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 says, let us all consider us as servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Uh, moreover, it is required that one be found faithful. So the, the, the greatest thing we can offer God is ourselves. Um, the Bible says in Philippians 2, 1, if there are any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, and the affection of mercy, fulfill my joy, having the same love, being of the same accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not on his own interest, but also on the interests of others. So this is an idea of offering ourselves. That's the sacrifice, is broken and contrite heart. But there's more to these verses to, uh, Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 5. Therefore, when he came to the world, he said, this is Jesus. When Jesus came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you've prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. Therefore, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will oh god remember jesus says not my will be done but yours so we see this is almost a complete um repeat of psalm 40 so it's attributed to david in psalm 40 but attributed to christ in psalm uh, in hebrews 10 except the ear he talks about a body you prepared so this is the idea of Jesus voluntarily giving his body to be broken for us. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Uh, he demonstrates his love towards us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is what's called the Messianic Psalm in which David is speaking about his own situation, but then the New Testament is attributed to Christ. And yet we give our ear, Christ gave his body to be broken for us. And so, boy, it's our reasonable service now to present our body and our sacrifice to him. So, so we're free. God has forgiven us of our sins. There's nothing we have to do to earn salvation. But we open our ears to listen, and we open our ears uh, as bond servants. God, I'm yours. I'm not required to... to to preach, to go to heaven. I'm not required to go to church. I'm not required to get baptized. But I do all those things as a bond servant of my Lord because uh, that's what he wants, a living sacrifice. The other thing he wants us to do is, is verse 9 of Psalm 40. I proclaim the good news of righteousness. Well, the good news is, is gospel. This is the new song in our hearts. Uh, I proclaim the good news of his righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. That's putting your light under a bushel. I've declared your faithfulness, your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Well, that sounds like it could be a New Testament verse. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about the good news. He's talking about your righteousness. Um, that's what we do. We, the great assembly, we assemble ourselves together and we proclaim the great news. We proclaim 
proclaim how great Christ is. And uh, so we are living sacrifices, praising God and, and taking the gospel to every creature, every nation. Um, why? Because we have to? No. Because it's required? No. Because it's our reasonable service that of all that Christ has done for us, that he's mindful of us, thinks about us so often he can't even be numbered, sent his only son to die for us, why would you not tell people that? Why would you not share that great news? Uh, pretty incredible what Christ has done for us. Um, and in that vein, it's very important that we have the proper view of ourselves. Uh, pride is, is dangerous. Um, so verse 11, he says, uh, do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. He needs God's mercy. Well, why do you need mercy? Well, you only need mercy if you've done something wrong. You're not asking for grace. You're asking not to be punished as you deserve. Uh, let your loving kindness and truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. See, this idea of a bond servant, this, this voluntary slavery to Christ, um, we fail. That's the problem. Our desire, like Paul says in Romans 7, that inner man desires to please God, to hear him say, well done. And yet, innumerable, uh, more than the hairs in our head are the times that we have you know, if you compare my sins, my failures, right, the times I've had a bad thought or said a bad word or, 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 or did something that wouldn't be considered a godly thing, that they're definitely more than the hairs of my head in my lifetime. So be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who... Seek to destroy my life. That's our enemy, Satan. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame who say to me, aha, uh -huh, uh -huh. And that's what the world does. They can't wait for you to fail. They can't wait for you to stumble. And we know that we do stumble. It, it's, it, it's not that Christians don't sin. It's that we don't like it. It bothers us. Uh, we don't revel in it. We don't celebrate it. We don't parade it. That's 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. We understand that we are sinners. We understand that we need a Savior. We understand that we need God's mercy every day. Romans 12, 3 says it this way. I say that through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one's measure of faith. Don't take pride in, in, in what you accomplish. That's why the Bible says, not my works, lest any man should boast. If there was something we had to do to be saved, we'd take that little speck we had to do and we would just be prideful about it. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. So it's like even the apostles, can I sit on your right hand? Is it, can I sit on your, well, our pride is terrible. First Peter 5, 5 says, likewise, you younger people submit to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast your care upon him, for he cares for you. Humble yourself. James 4.10 says it simply, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, he'll lift you up. Luke 14.11, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, our, our attitude towards God needs to be the same as it was for John the Baptist in John 3 and the they came to him and said, you know, there's, there's a man baptizing. And, and he says in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is 
of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Christ is above all. And that's that humble view. He must increase and we must decrease. And verse 16 goes on to say in Psalm 40, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy. If the Lord thinks upon me, you are my help, my deliverer. Do not delay. Oh my God, see, that's the whole point of this psalm. I am poor, I am needy, I'm a sinner, I need mercy. And yet, my deliverer thinks upon me. So many times that I can't even count. What a God, what a Savior, what a Lord, worthy to be praised. Which brings us to Psalm 41, which has a very interesting beginning, because it says... Um, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So he starts with this apparent encouragement to us. Blessed is he who considers the poor. But remember what David just got through saying in verse 17, um, chapter 40. But I am poor and needy. <laughs> so he, he says, yeah, blessed are who considers the poor, but... I, in this particular idea, he's the poor. We're the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so we have a God who considers us. The poor and the needy. Uh, what a blessing that is. So we can look at this verse in two ways. Uh, blessed are those who give. And we'll talk about those verses. But also, this is a blessing towards God. You're incredible that you would consider us these poor. So blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Well, who's the him? Those who consider the poor. So as God considers us the poor in spirit, then we consider others who are poor in spirit or even poor in in uh, material things. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. He will be blessed on the earth. There's some real benefits to, to blessing the poor and considering. <clears throat> you will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed uh, of illness. You will sustain him in his sickbed. So uh, our main consideration at this church and in the body of Christ are the poor in spirit, are those who need Christ, who are, are, uh, are bankrupt in their uh, knowledge of Christ. And so we consider them. And we also can consider those who are, uh, you know, God says, when you give to the least of these, you have given to me. And so we can definitely, when we're doing Nineveh or, or we're giving food out for brown bag, or doing some uh, benevolent work. The end game is to share the gospel. That's the main purpose of it. To somehow, some way, open a line of communication in which we can share with them how great Jesus Christ is. Because that's the true gift that we have, is the gospel, uh, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the gift of God, which is eternal life. Um, but there's blessing the, towards giving. Uh, Proverbs 11, 24 says, there's one who scatters yet increases more. And there are those who withhold more than is right. And it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be rich and who waters will be watered himself. So there's definite blessings to giving. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountiful will reap bountifully. So let each of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's the giving of the gospel or the giving of financial help, for sure. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, um, and will be put in your bosom. For the same measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. This is just the, the, the basics of you reap what you sow. Um, 
Again, that is physical labor, money, the gospel, spiritual knowledge, all those things, giving of your time and your energy. Those are all going to be returned with the blessings of God. Um, so now David, in these next few verses, he, it's another dual kind of uh, messianic, messianic verses. He says, I, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul. Now, let me talk about that just for a second. There's a lot of verses about healing. And we almost always, always equate them to physical healing. And so sometimes we get twisted to the fact of, you know, I've got this disease and I prayed that God would heal me. The Bible says God. If you pray, God would heal you. That God, if you ask God to heal you, he'll heal you. But a lot of times the healing in scripture is not. Sometimes a physical, remember Paul asked for three times for this infirmity to go away. And God said, no, you needed to humble yourself. There is no guarantee that God's going to heal you physically. And it's definitely not a sin or something wrong with you. If you have a physical uh, uh affirmity but the healing of the soul is where god is is talking about and, and that's a much more important healing than a physical healing what it'll do good if you if you're healed physically you know when, when jesus uh healed the blind man and said okay now you've been healed but there's more now you got to be healed of your sins uh remember when he healed the man that through the roof and he said thy sins be forgiven you they weren't mad about the the healing they were mad about the fact that he said his sins be forgiven you that's the true healing the healing of your soul and so whoever calls upon the name of the lord will be saved so that's where that healing comes whoever calls upon the name of the lord may not be physically healed of a physical infirmity but they will be saved and their soul will be healed. He says, heal my soul for I've sinned against you. That's why we need healing. There's a broken relationship. My enemies speak evil of me. And these next quotes are what the enemy are saying about David. So the enemy say about David, when will he die and his name perish? Boy, I hate this guy. If he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me, they devise my hurt. Well, it sounds like a political commercial, doesn't it? There's lies and blasphemies, not blasphemies, but uh, just uh, lies about David. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. Verse 9, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now in John 15, this verse is attributed to Christ talking about Judas. So it's got a dual. But in David's case, you know, uh, King Saul turned against him. I hit the pill. His, his trusted servant turned against him. Absalom's own son turned against him. So, so he knew what it was for familiar friends to turn against him. Um, and Jesus, one of his own apostles, betrayed him with a kiss. So he's heartbroken. You know, we were praying with someone this week, um, considering a family member who brought up something from 60 years ago. And uh, it's really hurt this person. And, and it's a shame. It's a shame that from our own familiar friends and even from our family, um, you know, if you have stood for Christ, it's very possible that you've had people turn against you, say things about you. And we have. Um, but the Bible says we have a, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that heartbrokenness is, is filled with this knowledge that Christ thinks of you more than you can number. He has died for you. He loves you. He has healed your soul. And verse 10 says, but you, O Lord, 
My friends have turned against me, but you, O Lord, be merciful to me. Raise me up that I may repay them. But I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. What a merciful God we have. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity. Set me before your face forever. How about that verse? The whole world may turn against you, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your church, your body, your whatever. But God will never. You have set your face before. You have set me before your face forever. Then it ends with a very interesting verse. It says, Blessed, well, let's let's read some verses first about, about God's mercy. Then I want to read this last verse separate. It says, we do not have a high priest who cannot, this is Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Come boldly to God. He loves you. Uh, sometimes when we sin, we, we run like Adam and did, and we hide from God. Now he loves you. Ephesians 2, 4 says, God who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has loved us. And David ends, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. A double amen there. Why? Because if you notice, probably you're, Bible, see, we have them open. This is the end of what's called book one. There's five, the book of Psalms is separated into five separate books. Um, and everyone ends with an amen and amen. So book two is verse chapters 42 to 72, then 73 to 89, 90 to 106, and 107 to 150. And all those last chapters end with amen and amen. So what have we glean today well your soul has been healed by god so let us take our lives presented as a living sacrifice have god open our ears isaiah 40 verse uh, 5 i believe it is uh, 50 verse 5 isaiah says the lord has opened my ears isn't that great as God open your ears, present your bodies a living sacrifice, build your life on the rock that is Christ. Let him take your life out of the miry place, set it on a solid rock, save your soul, surrender to him, confess to him. Lord, I'm a sinner. God, I believe you died for me. And if you're not sure, then ask him. Say, Lord, I need to know. I want to know. You confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive your sins. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works. It's a gift of God. So ask him, God, I want this gift of faith. I want to know that you are who you say you are. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the mercy, the blessings. We offer our bodies living sacrifices uh, to proclaim your name, proclaim the good news of the gospel to the world around us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget, we've got a, a fall festival this Sunday at 5 o'clock. Everyone's invited. It's going to be outside. Games can be fun. So just encourage you to come.